Thank you, Dr. Tafano. Um, uh, James, it's a huge pleasure to have you uh, with us here today as Minister for Climate Change. Actually, I think you should be Minister Against Climate Change. Yes. Rather than forward. <laughs> we'll come back to that later. Yeah. Um, just very, very briefly about um, James, because this is a very short session. Um, James uh, had his first crack at politics at 19 and in Wellington City Council and came seven out of ten candidates um, <laughs> in his election. He then went away and had a wonderful time, great career in the UK, doing deep sustainability stuff uh, with major corporates and came back to New Zealand in 2010, uh, which is where I first met uh, James because he came to work with us at the Arkina Foundation where we helped to develop social enterprises. And um, one of my best things was uh, having to work out the board policy of what happens when a, an employee wants to go into politics. Yeah, that right. was a real treat. <laughs> so um, James went back into politics, but lost again in 2011, yeah. and, but did get into parliament in policy 2014. <laughs> yes. Uh, by 2015, he was uh, co-leader of the Green Party, and by October 2017, he was in government with the Green Party and coalition uh, Labour-led with New Zealand First. And uh, James's two portfolios are Minister for Climate Change, and very interestingly, this is the left brain stuff, Minister for Statistics, because he believes the data is important. Um, so thank you. So I'm just um, going to hand straight over to James um, to give us his pitch uh, and about where we're heading with the Zero Carbon Act. And then I'm not going to ask the hard questions. I'm going to leave it all to you. So please queue up at the microphone. And we've got only 18 minutes for all of this. A very big hand for James, please. Thank you. Kia ato te ranga māori o te rangi e tūnei, a papa tū anu koe te kotonei, a te tai ui awhinei ki rangi e tātou. Ti hei Māori ora. May the blessings of the Earth Father above, uh, sorry, the Sky Father above, and the Earth Mother below, um, and the world all around us be with us all. Uh, I was a little bit late getting here, um, and I'm about to steal Lou Sanson's thunder, uh, because uh, this morning we announced that we were adding 68,500 hectares to the Kahurangi National Park. Um, uh, and the area that we've added is the Makahinui River catchment. Um, and I know that this will be very familiar to some of you because 12 years ago, uh, there was a proposal to put an 85 metre hydroelectric dam across the Makahinui uh, uh, River uh, and, um, and to turn that into electricity um, for uh, you all to store your data on. Um, and, and actually what happened was is that uh, New Zealanders said, uh, no thanks, no, there, there has to be another way. Uh, and, um, and, and so we saved the river, uh, and then what that has led to today is to us um, creating the largest addition to a national park in New Zealand's history. Uh, it's half the size of Auckland City. Um, it's larger than uh, the um, Abel Tasman National Park and the Poporangi National Park combined. Uh, and it's twice the size of Egmont National Park. So it's a really big deal. Um, and for those of you who are involved in that campaign, I just want to thank you very much because we wouldn't have been able to do it without that happening. So, it's a good day uh, in, that, in that sense. I, uh, um, actually, the Prime Minister, when she rang me up and we were doing the you know, portfolios, she said, is it of climate change? Because it can't be for climate change. <laughs> and we've kind of got of and for, and we worked at another few sentences and just decided of. Um, it was the easiest way to go. I don't know how old you're going to be in 2050. I'm going to be 77 years old. I was born in 1973. So just have a think about how old you're going to be uh, in the year 2050. What age, what's the exact number that you're going to be? For some of you, it'll be an improbable number. Uh, <laughs> most of you, you should be fine. Um, <laughs> I don't know what your life expectancy was when you were born. Um, I'm, I'm still planning to be around for it. But my point is, I'm going to be at the very end uh, of my career. In fact, I hope to be well retired by then. But the year 2050, if you're one of those people who will be in the middle of their careers, perhaps with children of your own, can you just imagine, on your weekends away, being able to go to bed at night 
knowing that the batch and the beach that you're enjoying today will still be there for your children and their children to enjoy the same way that you are. And when you wake up in the morning, you'll be awoken by a dawn chorus of birds that once bordered on extinction. And then you'll pack your kids into your electric car and drive along congestion-free motorways while the kids are counting the carriages on the freight trains that are running on the tracks alongside you. And when you stop for lunch, you'll get out and swim in the river, because you can, before you get home to your warm, dry, entirely solar-paneled house, solar-powered house. And on Monday morning, uh, in that Aotearoa, you'll get up and you'll catch the tram into town, where you'll do a good day's work at some social enterprise or a solar panel installer or a hydrogen manufacturing widget something <laughs> or other for a decent pay and then head home uh, where your kids will be playing on the grass by the side of the road with the children from you know, Pacifica communities, uh, Tangata Whenua, uh, the children of Syrian refugees uh, and so on. And, and the neighbourhoods will be connected because that's who we are. I mean, that's the future that we're talking about. And so the idea that there's something terrifying about that to me is just completely absurd. And so that's the future that we're trying to create. That's the picture that we need to paint for people as we stand here and say that the decisions that we make today will affect the lives uh, of those to come. And if there are people out there, and I know there's no one in this room who believes that, but if there are people out there who don't believe that, then they just need to ask a few questions of those kids who are striking for their own futures on Friday. So, uh, I'm much more interested in um, what it is uh, you have to say than I am uh, in what I have to say, because I hear what I say quite a lot, um, <laughs> and, and so does he. Uh, so um, so I'd, I'd like to um, kind of get into the, get into the court at all, but I just wanted to, uh, to start by saying that, because I, I think that in all of this kind of uh, left brain stuff that we get into around what is the plan, um, how are we going to create that, that future, that we actually forget what it is the future that we're trying to create. Kia ora. Um, thank you very much indeed, James. Uh, 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 being uh, strong-eyed and realistic about all the enormous challenges, uh, but being very um, optimistic and encouraging about how we can make this uh, a great deal better um, is, the great, uh, is the great dual act here. So thank you for emphasizing that, um, the hope and inspiration part. Um, microphone there. If you want to ask a question for, the, for James, please do line up. And I'm going to start with this question. Um, here at uh, EHF and uh, New Frontiers, uh, this is a place, that, uh, a space that we can hold for conversations, um, sometimes difficult conversations. What role can we play, um, particularly this year, as you and your colleagues are working very hard on um, achieving a Zero Carbon Act? Um, what are some of the conversations that you think uh, we should be contributing to um, to um, help this work progress? I mean, in other words, where are some of the great tensions that we need to um, uh, bridge? Well, uh, what was your name? Sorry? Severin. Yeah, Severin, I think, pointed directly at uh, the, the tension that everyone's very familiar about in, in, in New Zealand, the thing that uh, has really prevented New Zealand from making much progress over the last 30 years. I every country in the world uh, has industries that they rely on and specialise in um, and that create a lot of the wealth for that, for that country. And every single one of those industries comes with consequences. Uh, and uh, so the transition from where we are today to what we are in the future always, in every country, deeply affects its core you know, uh, industry. You look at what's going on in Australia, right, where about 80% of their electricity comes from brown coal and it's their leading export. Um, it's no great surprise that the politics of climate change have run into the brick wall uh, when it comes to uh, coal in, in, in Australia. Um, and um, 
and, and here, uh, you know, we have um, had huge challenges uh, creating any kind of constructive dialogue around the future of agriculture. And what I know that, you know, one of the things that you often say to farmers is, you know, your, your farms will be worth more 30 years from now than they are today, but they will look very different 30 years from now than they do today. Uh, and that helps to, I think, kind of relax uh, people a little bit because we're sort of stuck in the moment of thinking this is what we've always done, therefore it will be what we've always, we always will do. That's actually incorrect. If you project back 30 years to 1989, which was peak sheep in New Zealand, we had three times as many sheep in New Zealand as we do today and half as many cows. And so in exactly the same time period as we're talking about making this shift into the future, we've had tremendous change and land use change uh, in, in that period of time. And all of that was simply, and our farms are worth a great deal more today than they were 30 years ago in 1989. Uh, and, and so I think one of the things that um, people in, in this room can do, you know, the, innovative, the innovators, um, the social uh, uh, enterprises, um, is, is to kind of make that future okay for people who might feel like they're excluded from it. You know, and to say actually there are things you know there are things that we can do here. This is about all of us, um, and and it's one of the things that I, I'm very passionate about. We talk a lot about the just transition, um, is that uh, it has to include everyone, and and in particular, that isn't just kind of people whose jobs are likely to change. You know, vulnerable people and so on. That's where we pay a lot of attention, and that's important. But it's also actually people who are doing really well out of the status quo today. Mm. Like it has to include them too. Uh, and, and that's quite a big leap for a lot of people uh, to make. Yes, thank you. Um, a, a question there, thank you. Yeah, so it's continuing this uh, line of thought. So I, I have some friends that are farmers in Southland, for example. Mm. They're of a generation that for them it would be quite a big change to move to such policies. So how does the conversation look? Because often you'd hear from them, oh, the government added more, more uh, land to the national park. It's now going to be harder to... Uh, do stuff in that area. So how does how does the transition for those that are already um, not going to have it easy to change all their habits as farmers? How how do you imagine this conversation? There, there's been, I think, a, a huge shift uh, in um, in the conversation from farmers. Um, it's it's not a monolithic voice. Um, it, I'm not sure it ever was, but certainly in recent years, it's it's been quite. Different, and it is interesting that there's, I think, quite a generational split. So, a lot of the younger farmers, people in their 30s and their 40s, are, you know, embracing whether it's regenerative agriculture or, or high precision agriculture. Um, uh, you know, looking at alternative proteins. A friend of mine over in the Wairarapa Arapa has just started a cricket farm um, for a local bakery. You know, the, all all of these kinds of things are s sort of starting to emerge, and they're using drones to monitor river quality and you know th there's some really exciting stuff going on and they're actually kind of embracing it because what they see is that there is this kind of high value uh, proposition where the thing that we're selling isn't just the protein, uh, it's, it's the air and the soil and the water and the story uh, that comes from where, where it's come from. Um, and yes, and, and there is you know, a pretty substantial group of people who are locked into a great deal of debt, who don't have, f feel that they've got too many uh, options to move. And actually we need to orient ourselves towards those people and to say, well, what, you know, how, how can we help? Because um, I think our orientation has been, you're bad and wrong and you, you, know, you need to kind of, we don't want that anymore. And when I say, you know, to a multi-generation farmer. I come from a multi-generation farming family. We don't want your product anymore. Part of what we're saying is we don't want you anymore. And it's at the level of identity, and so it's no great surprise we get some resistance. So we need to cut that out um, and, and kind of flip the orientation to say, there is a future here. It's, a, it's a, actually a, a better future. Um, what's it gonna take to help shift from where we are today to where we need to be? Um, yeah, uh, Mike, thank you. Thank you. Um, kia ora, Minister Shaw. Um, I'm Mike Hart. I'm the CEO of Sierra Energy out of California and a member of, of CUIA, uh, uh, cohort for CUIA. Um, I wanted to ask you about waste. Um, in New Zealand, it's one of the higher per capita producers of waste mm. and the resulting about 40 million tons of greenhouse gas equivalent mm -hmm. for methane coming out of the, the landfills is a significant issue. Um, my company, 
takes waste and turns it to clean energy with 100% recycling, um, which we've developed in the United States. And that's 100% of the entire waste stream. And one of the things that we've been having a dialogue over the last few <laughs> You've days... You've got my attention. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but we've had a dialogue over the last few days about the notion of a zero-waste New Zealand. Yeah. There's only 17.8 thousand tons of, um, of waste a, a day, which is actually quite manageable. And so the notion was, um, would there be a, a, a right place to begin a dialogue uh, about taking a technology um, to actually make New Zealand the first zero-waste nation in the world? Yes, there is. <laughs> yeah, I'm in the right room. Um, yeah, so that's uh, eugenie.sage at parliament.govt.nz. Uh, so so my, my colleague, um, Minister Eugenie Sage, uh, is she's Minister of Conservation and um, National Parks, uh, but also uh, she's the Associate Minister for the Environment with Responsibility for Waste. Uh, and um, it is one of the four big environmental priorities of this government is to, is to deal uh, with waste. And uh, I know many of you all know uh, Vicky Robertson, the CEO of uh, Ministry for the Environment, has been um, struggling with the fact that she's resourced up to deal with one environmental priority, and we have four. Uh, but, but waste has been one of the things, and we're going to be doing some um, big circular economy uh, kind of strategic system shift stuff this year. So we did a, a very symbolic move last year, which was the phase out of single-use plastic bags, but that, as uh, an old colleague of mine used to say, is merely the gateway drug to the, <laughs> to the larger problem. Um, and, um, and, and so we're very interested. And, and we do see it as a source of innovation and uh, creating local industry and so on. And I have to say, uh, so New Zealand, as you have noticed, there's almost no one who lives here. Right. Um, this is, uh, and uh, sorry. Except in Auckland. Except in Auckland um, which, yeah, which has about as many people as a large suburb of San Francisco. Um, uh, and and so we've had the luxury of exporting our waste into the environment, or shipping it to China. Um, and both of those options are now closed to us because we're running out of space to merely throw things in a hole in the ground. And and China doesn't want our rubbish anymore. You know, good on them. Um, and so that's forcing us to take responsibility for it. So this is the year. This is the year for that. Kiara, yeah. thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Yes, please, thank you. Uh, Kiara James. Kiara. I was just wondering, um, given the, the kind of nature of the three-year election cycle and the fact that when we look at politics, uh, our elected officials are oftentimes kind of drawn away from passing really uh, hardy... Uh, policies, I suppose, around environmental issues, and then they also put their uh, re-election or careers at risk or at risk having that undone within the next election cycle. What can we do as citizens to uh, both pressure and support our elected officials to really pass the kind of drastic measures that we need within politics? <laughs> One minute, 24 on the clock. Okay, um, <clears throat> I have a list. Uh, but it, it is, I mean, there's, unfortunately, there is no short answer to that, right? Um, but a, a few things. So the, you're absolutely right that there's a, there's a big tension there. And the stuff that is really going to make a difference is uh, stuff that deals with the system as a whole. So the Zero Carbon Act when it comes to climate change, um, reforms to the emissions trading scheme, when it comes to waste, the things that we're going to be launching later on this year are kind of very much at the level of system. Uh, and that's actually what politics is good for, right? Because it actually it is the, the institution that can deal with some of those kind of system level uh, shifts. But there is a short term imperative. Um, and, and we need to kind of strike a balance, you know, of doing things that shift the system that are kind of too complex to make it onto the front pages of the newspaper versus banning single-use plastic bags, which does make it onto the front page, which is a tiny part of the overall problem, but is, the, is, is symbolic of, of the overall thing. But one thing that the people in this room in particular can do, because I think you're better equipped to do it than just about any other group uh, in, in society, is, is actually to start shouting about the, the system stuff as well, because I just think most of it never gets seen. And, and, and our, it's not just the political structures, the media structures that we have aren't designed to kind of deal with that. Like, they find it really hard because um, of the pressures on, on them. And, and so that kind of stuff comes from elsewhere. You know, we can talk about it all we like, but 
as you'll notice, I'm not given to snappy answers. Um, so that would be one thing. Uh, I think another thing is to um, advocate for change to the political system itself. Most of us in it are very aware uh, of how much it needs to change. Um, but we feel that we can't lead on that because it looks self-interested and like we're making up our own set of rules. That can only really come from outside. So, you know, ha having a constitution that deals with, uh, you know, some of those kinds of systemic issues in the political domain are, are one of those things. And, and, the, and the, I, I, I was a process facilitator before I got into politics. And one thing that we say is, uh, you know, that the quality of the outcome is almost entirely a product uh, of the process by which you get to that outcome. And if you want to create um, really good outcomes for the future of New Zealand, can I tell you, you would not design the process of parliament. Um, uh, and, and so that fundamentally needs a redesign if, it, if it's going to be able to deal with some of those really multi-generational challenges. Yeah. Um, uh, just to say thank you for doing the job you do uh, and uh, for being with us today. And I can't imagine anything more fabulous than um, on Friday in front of Parliament um, addressing um, all those um, students who are out of school to mm. protest for the future. So uh, have a great time on Friday. Oh, I will. Thank you. Maybe a very see big you there. Hand thank for you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul.